let's go on to America and hopefully do something that's a little more entertaining, which is talk about Americans talking about their own history. Is that we briefly saw was that Al Sharpton? Uh, just you saw. will see Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton. He used to be enormous. Yeah. He's a huge guy. He's so very he's, much thinned down. Oh, he? yes, he yeah. has, yes. Yeah. Um, but anyway, sorry. I don't want to preempt. He hasn't uh, wisened up, though. Right, okay. uh, because one, one thing about Americans that has become apparent is they don't really know anything about America, as in why America is what it is and how it came to be. And Al Sharpton actually uh, was the inspiration for this segment because he kind of put the crown on top of the, uh, the the cherry on the cake, uh, the the angel on the tree. It was just the most amazing statement that I think we'll get to. Before we do, if you want to support us, go and watch the uh, Epochs on the Siege of Waco. It's an interesting part of American history, but of course it does an excellent job. I think he's with Josh there as well. Um, but anyway, so let's, let's begin this with just this article from the New York Post, where that 41,000 Americans in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. were surveyed, and they don't know much about American history. Only 27% of those under 45 could demonstrate a basic knowledge of American history. Only four in 10 Americans passed the little exam that they were given. And the study also revealed that 15% of American adults were able to correctly note the year the U.S. Constitution was written. 50. 15. Uh, this was 1787. Now, if you're not an American, why would you be expected to know that? Mm -hmm. but if you're an American, you think that would be something you would know. Uh, and only 25% could correctly state that the Constitution has had 27 amendments. Again, if you're not an American, why would you know that? Uh, a quarter of the survey takers were unaware that freedom of speech was guaranteed under the First Amendment. 57% did not know that Will Woodrow Wilson was the president during World War I. Uh, the distressing results show that American education is not working. The students are not asked to memorize dates, events, and leaders, which polls show that they are not retained in adulthood. It's like, yeah. And uh, I found another article on the LA Times, which I thought was interesting. And this is just remarkable, right? Most Americans do not know which countries the US fought against in World War II. Well, you see, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, yes, uh, I used to write for the LA Times, actually, when I was, when I was living uh, there. And I, I was just wondering how, you know, what is the kind of uh, trajectory here? Yeah. Did they know a lot more? Ten years ago, I mean, the students. You know, did they know? Would they have known mm. who America was fighting? I don't. I mean, I should hope so. I would hope so. But I mean, before we get too smug about this, uh, I'm not saying it's any better in Britain. Yes, I. <laughs> it used to be, but um, I think you might struggle now. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. This is uh, yeah. For our American viewers, don't worry. I don't think that young people in Britain know about Britain's history I, mm. at all. Um, but uh, of course. You know, they can't point to Ukraine or Belarus on a map. And uh, they stare blankly if you ask them who represents them in the state legislature or what rights are protected by the First Amendment. Uh, they say that there's nothing particularly new about this, but I would say that it's probably getting worse. Yes. Um, I think that this is uh, not good. In 2019, just 13% of eighth graders were deemed to be proficient in history based on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, an exam sometimes called America's Report Card. Only 22% were found to be proficient in civics. That's really bad. No, it's, it's, it's simply important. But you see, the, now they have an excuse not to know. Well. But they can just simply say, well, why would I want to know that kind of, you know, white racism? supremacist bullshit? Yeah. You know, you can almost yeah. hear them saying it, you know. And you'll get things like the 1619 Project where they will deliberately try to pervert history mm. in order to make sure that you don't really know what happened. Now, this I found is a particularly fascinating thing because the 1619 Project was a, a, a attempt at historical revisionism by a journalist called Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, who writes for the New York Times. And this was highly critiqued and re refuted by historians as soon as it came out because it hinges around a key lie. The lie is that the American uh, Revolution was fought to keep slavery. That's right. Yeah. 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 No, no it no. wasn't. Yeah. Uh, for anyone who is wondering, um, the British Empire didn't attempt to start outlawing slavery until something like 1808. Yep. Uh, so the US had been independent for at least a generation. 
and wasn't successful in abolishing slavery until 1830. Mm. So no, this is just a complete lie. And this person was a fact checker on that. And they say, well, look, I, I was like, I'm in total, com I, I totally agree that we should rewrite American history in order to characterize all of America as racist. Yeah. And it has been. But the problem is if we start on false narratives, then people will refute our entire project. And so it wasn't that she was like, well, maybe we shouldn't lie about these things. She was just like, well, maybe we shouldn't have a lie that overturns our entire project. In fact, she says this, uh, both sets of inaccuracies worried me, but the revolutionary war statement made me especially accurate, uh, anxious. So, I mean, there are obviously other inaccuracies, uh, but that particular one about the revolutionary war. Overall, the 1619 project is a much needed corrective to the blindly celebratory histories that once dominated our understanding of the past. Histories that wrongly suggested that racism and slavery were not a central part of US history. I was concerned that critics would use the overstated claim to discredit the entire undertaking. So far, that's exactly what's happened. Overstated claim. Yes, yeah, yes. So it's not like there isn't a general hatred of the United States that is pervading through the history. And so, I mean, I'm not particularly, what, I'm not particularly surprised that young people are just not interested in history. But the thing is, it, she writes for the New York Times. She does, yeah. But uh, also, it's become a New York Times project. Yes, it was. You know, it is. It, project the New yes, York. it is something that they initiated. Yeah. This is the New York Times, which is, you know, the most respected paper in America, at least it was. Yeah. And without wishing to digress, the decline, well, you know, that's been a theme of this week's podcast. I'm afraid it the, is. You know, the, decli the decline of the New York Times is just yep. something to behold. It is outright propaganda. It is yes. complete and hatred of Britain yes. as well. Hatred of America, hatred yeah. of Britain, hatred of the West, mm. hatred of anything that, de that demonstrates excellence, you know, mm. success, strength, competence. Anything like that. And indeed, as well, what it does there, what has happened there, is a um, famous case last year when basically the more junior staff, mm -hmm. if you like, get to reporters get together and make sure that, say, like an editor they disapprove of loses her job, which is what happened. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you know they, they have this kind of power to do it. You know, management is sort of you know, like that, frightened of these people. Mm. Um, but I think it's just... It's just one of the big sort of, you know, icon, cultural icons of American life, which has completely changed, yep. you know, um, in the past 10 years. No, that's absolutely correct. And it, I mean, and again, just the quality of people is the mm. You can see that the people writing are not as good as the writers of previous generations. I mean, whenever you go back and watch just television debates, mm. you do not see the level of articulation of the point that you used to then, you can't see that anywhere now. No, actually, America, American culture, I would say during the, what many people call the real kind of, the, you know, apotheosis of uh, uh, imperialism, American, the American empire, 1950s and 60s, they would regularly have dramas mm. on CBS mm. and NBC and these sort of, networks um they would have cello concerto with you know pablo casals playing things like this high culture yes exactly not all the time but i mean it would be there and it wouldn't be considered weird yeah that it was on you'd have william f buckley jr yes. with his like you know hour-long philosophical discussions yes with leading thinkers of the time that like the audience Orvidale. would be expected to keep up with. yes exactly and you just don't, don't get that now. It, it has sort of obviously to kind of, the, the problem is i think now is as i say is that people have been given a kind of excuse um to not know anything about it plus uh well she's chicken and egg thing isn't it mm. but for example if you're going to do this kind of thing, if you're going to basically try to subvert the whole foundation of your history, uh, it does help if people don't know what you're doing. It so does. Like, it does. It, That's you know, exactly the fact right. Is, 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 if you think of Britain, how many people, how many, take some of the uh, anniversaries we've had recently. So uh, Magna Carta, how many really know what that's about? Very few, I think, actually. Can't yeah. now. You know, the King James Bible was about 10 years or so ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, big anniversary um why do what is why was that the significance yeah. of of the king james bible i i'm sure it's a loss on most people and uh, you know 
There was a great book I had as a kid, which I'm sure you did too, called 1066 and all that. And it was a kind of, no, it was a historical, it was written in the 1930s and it was an historical, uh, very gentle parody of history teaching. Lovely book. But everyone knew 1066, said, well, of course, that's when the Normans came and everything. But I don't think you could have that title now because I think even that title, and we're coming up to a thousand years, a thousand years, there's, that's a terrible, there's a terrible omen there somewhere, actually, Carl. You know, like, we're coming up, aren't we, to a thousand years. 1066 to, uh, well, actually, 2166. Yeah. yeah. So, we're actually, we're over it, aren't we, already? Yeah, we must. Well, yeah. no, it's 2066. 20, 20, yes, 2066. Uh, we would be 2166, won't we? No, the, the, <laughs> we're, we're 2023 at the moment. Yes. So of course we are. 20, so, yes. 43 years. Yeah, time. yeah. So, but the thing is, that actually might be in 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 our in our lifetimes, you know. If we're well, yes, but I mean, can you imagine? Lucky enough, you know what? That's yeah. almost like a like a, a pair of you know. Is it's like a bookends? A bookend. Yeah. It's like the you know. Might it be? Mm. You know. Well, you will be. I won't be here. But well, I doubt it. I mean, I'll, I'll be more important. Your so. children will be here. Yeah, my hopefully my children will be here. Yeah. My grandchildren, if I'm lucky enough. But uh, but you are you are completely right about this. It's easy to fool people about history if they don't know anything about history. Right? I saw this going around the other day, which I mean, this is just everything about young people now, right? Women weren't even allowed to have credit cards until 1974, so you know it's empowering that I've maxed mine out. Ha ha ha. Um, Visa was created in 1976. I went and looked this up, right? So I just looked up the history of credit cards. The first credit card was launched in 1958, right? But she's she's acting like credit cards were something invented by the ancient Greeks. And we were just like, oh yeah, women weren't allowed them <laughs> until 1974. They were created in 1958, so 18 years or 16 years before women were allowed them, right? But that's only because they weren't on a wide scale. Yeah. Like the first one went out to 60,000 people. And it wasn't until Visa was created in 1976 that there was a nationwide credit card in America anyway. So to act like, oh, women have been oppressed. They didn't, shut up. You know nothing. Yeah. You know, this is the thing. You are an idiot. And now you've got, you know, massive amounts of credit card debt. And you're bragging on social media as if this is some win. Is this TikTok or? Yeah, it's a TikTok video that I took a screenshot from. Um, and it was just... <sighs> Everything about the modern world is just a tremendous mistake. Also, I saw one very similar to this. So obviously, you know, she's dancing she's, in the ruins of our civilization. Yes, exactly. Yes, but also sort of essentially using it as an excuse. There was yes. uh, there was one I saw again TikTok, and it was a woman giving it was marital woman. advice. Do you do? Oh, was this Mia Khalifa? Yes. Yes, I and saw she this. was more or less yeah. sort of saying, you know. Yeah. Don't worry if you want to leave. Just don't worry. What's the big deal? She said, she, I've been married three times. Take yes. advice from me. It's like, no, that's why you don't take advice from well, me. Well, exactly. And also, if it, if it's if it's such a little deal, why is she bothered to go through it three times? Yeah. That's you know? another great why? question. Why? Just, 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 just you, know, you know, stay with the, you know, live with the guy or whatever. Yeah. Mm. And so I thought I would get to uh, Al Sharpton, who, as you say, he has lost a lot of weight, hasn't he? Uh, I thought we'd just watch this because it's just funny. You know, I, I thought about this as I was looking through the indictment last night, and uh, I grew up and started my activism in a section of Brooklyn called Brownsville. And walking to the subway many mornings, some of the guys in the neighborhood would say, Rev, I caught a case. I have never walked down that block, and somebody said, I caught three cases. I mean, this is just <laughs> as low as it gets. I've never heard of three cases on one individual in three jurisdictions. So this is serious. But on the other side of it, one day our children's children will read American history. And can you imagine our reading that James Madison or J Thomas Jefferson tried to overthrow the government so they could stay in power? That's what we're looking at. We're looking at American history and how it will play out <clears throat> is going to be very important. The sad part about this to me is that this is not a man that is facing all this because he believed in a political position or political policy or cause. I've seen people go down the wrong side for a cause. This we'll leave him there because he's obviously <laughs> talking about the Donald Trump indictment, but it's just like, <laughs> I can't believe James Madison or Thomas Jefferson 
I have a dream of overthrowing government. Are you, what are you mad? Do you not know what country you're in? Like, have you do know who these people are? Like, it's genuinely funny at this point, but it's comical. Like, I mean, all the people on MSNBC, not yes. one of them are like, well, they were revolutionaries. Yes, but these people don't challenge him at all on anything. In any way, shape, or form. You know. Because Donald Trump somehow is bad, and therefore... Yeah. Yeah. But it's just... I mean, honestly, just everything yeah. everywhere is just pathetic, actually. Yes. You know, it's like, what is happening here? Why is he on TV saying, oh, I can't believe George Washington would be a revolutionary? Oh, yeah, as if he'd... Maybe, you know, be crazy if he let an army... <laughs> <laughs> Like, he didn't cross the Delaware in the middle of winter or anything. You, what are you doing? Actually, you say, it's interesting. I don't know has it, whether he's gone through some kind, or he's just, you know, got a new career, but he was just a rabble rouser, if yes. I remember, in the 1970s. Yeah. You know, he was sort of turn up and everything. And uh, indeed, he was parodied in a wonderful Tom Wolfe book called Bonfire of the Vanities, um, where he just used to kind of, Attach himself to various cases yeah. that were to do with race. He's been race grifting That's for literally right. decades. But you're talking about the 70s and 80s. Uh, and here he is, sort of, you know, sort of, it's almost like he's maybe trying to become a political commentator or something. Well, he is, but no, Very notice. Promising start. But notice what he's appealing to here, right? He's saying, you know, um, he's appealing to the existing structures of the United States, right? The existing narrative of the United States. Oh, Donald Trump is trying to overthrow the Republic and therefore. You know, the Republic must be a good thing, but hang on, you spent your entire life saying that this was bad. Mm -hmm. You spent your entire life demonizing and stigmatizing. So why are you now on the side of those structures? And it's because there is some kind of insurgent force in our civilizations that is taking control of the narrative of the civilizations. And now it wants to legitimize itself by connecting itself artificially to these histories mm -hmm. and saying, well, could you believe that Thomas Jefferson would be a revolutionary? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the you can see how the, the whole thing is just lies upon lies upon lies upon lies. Other thing as well with this, this kind of example, but also just generally with the historical ones you're talking mm. about, is it's not just that you don't have to learn about history. Um, the idea of fact, uh, at, well, basically the I idea of truth as expressed in facts, yes. um, c you can now, you know, it, it, it's contentious. So basically, you can sort of say that is entirely just uh, truth is a supremacist thing, mm. or you know facts are these these kind of it's a bit like saying yep. mathematics is you know racist, which is what you're yep. hearing more and more now. And so, if you can basically, if you just take the carpet from underneath all of this, mm. you're left with nothing. You're left. You're left with the ability to mold people into whatever form you want them to take. Right. So you can have people thinking that America is always a racist project, but we need to be considerate of the founding fathers who had, you know, who, who are in some way authoritative and have set up the democracy that, I mean, do you remember AOC uh, called it our sacred capital building? I'm like, but that's not an American frame. Mm. Like the Americans do not believe government is sacred. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what a monarch thinks. Yeah. And they think that they, literally the, it was instituted by God and therefore. That underpins it. No, the, the idea of the, the United States is that the people come together and form a government of their own choosing, which means the government is utterly temporal and is totally available to be dismantled by the people if they choose to dismantle it. Yes. There's no spiritual yes. authority behind the United States government, and that's the point of yes, the United States. Yes, yes. So the, these people are just totally off the reservation, yes. but they are not Americans as a normal person would understand what an American is. And so it's just like the, the, it doesn't matter what the continuum of truth that people are trying to adhere to is, mm. you can just make people into anything that you want. Women, oh, they've always been oppressed. Couldn't get credit cards until before there was a national credit card, you see. And so, why are you even talking? You know, and so, anyway, it's all just lies upon lies upon lies. And well, I think, you see, when you say me. you can make people, you know, into what you want them to be, that sort of implies that there's a plan. Um, or you could sort of take the approach which tends to be mine, which is sort of, you know, the same genus really, mm. uh, which is that this is an attack at the most fundamental level on everything that we are. Yes. Um, and essentially then you could say, well, by whom, where's it going? Um, cultural Marxism, whether it's the long yeah. march to the institution, same thing. 
Uh, it's all of those things, isn't it's, it? Essentially, yes. Basically, this goes right down to the trans issue. It's essentially to shake the foundations of what we even think we are biologically. Yes, yes. It's to, it's to, hugely successful. It is. It's, it's the probably the most successful political project of the last fifty years, mm. and it it is actually concerning that for some reason, like the people who are charged with defending against these things such as the Conservative Party or the Republican Party, are unable to do so. They don't know how. This has been such an oblique attack on them, they've been totally blindsided by it. They're just like, oh, God. But they don't know how, but also, to an extent, they have also been slightly captured. <laughs> well, it, you it, know, the, I mean... The Republicans less so, I would yeah, say. Yeah, less the so. The Conservatives far yeah. more. You know, the Conservatives well, are willing. Basically. Here, actually, it wasn't just... It was actually self-capture, if yeah. there was such a thing. They sort of went ahead and said, right, we want these people don't, during Cameron's time. We want yeah. these people. And essentially, many of them weren't... It's not just me being colloquial, saying, oh, they're not really concerned. They actually weren't. I no. mean, they were Lib Dems and things like that. I mean, David Cameron literally said he decided to modernize mm. the Conservative Party because it was pale, male, and stale. And so he was like, right, we're going to have minority shortlists or women shortlists. It's like, but that's Labour Party policy. Mm. That's literally what the Labour Party do. Why are you doing it? But anyway, yeah, so uh, good luck, America. <laughs> it's like good luck here, good you luck, know, South you Africa, see, good luck see everywhere. These kind of, you know, these little uh, box pops, you see yeah. them often on, are very, very, very funny. I remember seeing one during the uh, the Clinton uh, Trump uh, 2016 yeah. election. And uh, these girls, this is a very clever guy, actually, because he was very convincing. But he was just saying, um, we've just heard, you know, that. Uh, Hillary Clinton has announced she's going to introduce Sharia law uh, <laughs> to the uh, United States as a, as a woman. Yeah. You know what is your view on that? And of course, they 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 were literally saying, "Well, if Hillary says that it's a good thing for women, then yeah, I'm with that." You know, amazing. They just they didn't know. But then yeah. again, I mean, you know, I have to say that I'm increasingly you know, amazed at what younger people don't know about our history. Now. But I think there's been a sort of deliberate attempt to detach them from yes. the moral content of our own history mm. in order to make sure that they don't feel like they're the possessors of it, mm. right? Because they should feel like they own our culture and that they have an obligation and a responsibility to uphold it and continue on into the future. So their children, that they should want to have, will also possess this accumulation of good things that we have ourselves been the inheritors of and they just don't they feel like they're nowhere people who don't belong in any place in time and who don't understand the difference between the past the present and the future well actually nowhere people are interesting uh you know i would say the other way is that they i think you're being you know that's sort of one negative way of saying you could say they're anywhere people who think they're so wonderful that they can actually settle down somewhere, wherever <laughs> they are in the world. It, yeah. They, you know, I do not need neighborhoods. I do not need roots. I do not need this, that, the other. I, my individual, my, my individual talent, my creativity, what I am, you know, uh, this will basically flourish wherever I am in the world. Mm. And really, you know, these people with the David Goodhart, anyways, uh, they exist. You know, I mean, I remember I was really struck by this actually when I used to live in Woolwich. Um, I lived in these flats and uh, it was full of like young professional kind of anywhere type. I mean, they were all kind of, uh, you know, Remainers and all, all mm. of that. Um, but they were very unneighborly. Mm. The older people were always neighborly. Yeah. And indeed, people who would come from other countries actually were neighborly. But these young kind of woke type, they, it was all in their head. It was all theory, if you know what I mean, Carl. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They, on a day-to-day -day level, they wouldn't have dreamt of volunteering to do something, yeah. for example. They could barely say hello, good morning. It was all, they were so wrapped up in themselves, yeah. you know. There's a distinct level of vanity to this anywhere person, isn't there? Yeah, it's a sort of conceit, you know, yeah. exactly. The, the absolute, you know, I am uh, a person of infinite creativity and therefore all these things, family, neighborhood, nation, all of these things will put a constraint on that. These somehow. are drags on me. Yeah. It's not that I could, should be obligated to other people. Exactly. It's actually, they're a problem that I need to shear away from me. 
Yes, exactly. You know, to fly free like the butterfly yes. that I am. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes, yeah. and I'm very fortunate. You see, you see, uh, you know, uh, 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 basically parents kind of egging that on, you know, in kids yeah. uh, now. But that is essentially the difference between the kind of urban sort of increasingly what we would now call woke, but they were originally weren't uh, anywhere types, you know. And uh, of course, you know, it's, it's interesting you were saying about how we owe our culture something. Uh, conser- people of a conservative mind have always been greater at organizations and uh, volunteering mm-hmm. and giving you know, organizing the fate and all of yeah. that stuff. Just you know, local community. Yes, all of that, not getting any money necessarily out of it. Um, far better than the left. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site, such as this symposium episode, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Part 1. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.